everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, great. Um, actually, before we begin the program, I'd like to read a land acknowledgement really quickly. It's very pertinent to what we, we're discussing here tonight. We acknowledge that we are standing on the traditional land of the Nankochenk and the Piscataway peoples, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have been the stewards of this land through generations. So briefly, I'd like to introduce um, our guest tonight. I just want to tell you, you can't take your mask off. Oh, we can. OK, great. I think we'll do it. Sing mascara. OK, great. <laughs> Woohoo! this is me. <laughs> it's nice to meet you all, finally. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, thank you. Um, so to my right, I have um, Councilor Manuel Carmona Yebra who is Counselor of Environment and Oceans at the Delegation of the European Union um, to the United States. And further to my right is Celia Ledon, the, a costume designer from Cuba. Her work is on display right behind us, um, and we'll get a chance to get to know her work and see her at work in a moment. So my role as a moderator is to help craft some connective threads between practice and policy, between individual consumers, designers, and large corporate players um, in a problem that has a very wide range of stakeholders and interests and a problem that affects us all. So to set the stage, we're going to start with a short video from the EU, um, and then we'll pick up the conversation with Councillor Carmona. It's one I got during my studies, so more than 10 years ago and it carries fond memories from some of the most important years of my life. Our clothes reflect our mood, our character and personal taste. Textiles are all around us, but we have somehow broken our long-lasting relationship with them. The way we consume clothes is highly unsustainable. In the EU we waste about 5.8 million tons of textiles, around 11 kilos per person. This waste and fast fashion pollutes our environment and requires excessive use of precious resources like water, energy, fossil fuels. Not to mention all problems coming from the discarding of textiles. Most of them end up in incineration or landfills in Europe and even abroad. It's time that fast fashion is driven out of fashion. That's why we put forward our pioneering EU textile strategy. By 2030, textile products placed on the EU market should be long-lived, recyclable and recycled, free of hazardous chemicals and produced in a fair way. We can achieve that with mandatory eco-design requirements and a brand new digital product passport for textiles and more reuse and repair services. We want to tackle microplastics, introduce extended producer responsibility and stop the destruction of unsold or returned garments. All this won't happen without a competitive, resilient and innovative textile sector. Our fashion can become greener with deep changes that require efforts by all of us. Let's become more conscious consumers with fashion brands joining us in that green transition. That was great, thank you. So the commissioner gives us a really great introduction to the problem that we're going to be talking about tonight, and in particular how the EU is meeting the challenge. Um, I'm sure a crazy amount of work went into creating the strategy and getting it ready for adoption, um, and actually we're really grateful to have a strategy like that um, to follow. I'd like you to share a few more details on the 2030 goals of the strategy, but first, um, why textiles? I, I was looking that on our own um, website here of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and textiles aren't even listed as an environmental topic. Um, and can you tell us also how the concern for textiles fits into the EU's broader green deal? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, is this working? I hope so. Um, thank you so much, Erica. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much to the Kennedy Center for inviting me, inviting us to this great discussion. And uh, to your very, very good questions, um, I mean, you had my boss, um, Virginius Sinkevicius, is a commissioner 
for Environment and Oceans in the European Commission uh, there in Brussels. Now, how we came about to this text as a strategy? Uh, the context uh, takes us back to 2019, really. If I have to point at a, at a starting uh, day, let's say a, set, a starting point in time. At that time, we had European elections uh, in the European Parliament, and uh, it was clear that the voters expressed uh, the need uh, and the concern to tackle environmental issues from climate to pollution, uh, biodiversity, uh, laws, etc. So uh, those elections marked turning point in terms of the priorities expressed by the, uh, by the Europeans. And I have to say also that this was right before the pandemic. We all know that. So uh, we put together this strategy called European Green Deal. Uh, European Green Deal trying to uh, consider, integrate nature in the way we run our economy in Europe, right? This is in, in a nutshell what it means. It's connecting the dots between the economy and nature. They are not uh, independent from each other. They are, they are the basis for each other, on the contrary. Now what happened is when this was approved in 2019 as a response to the elections, right away the pandemic came about. It's quite ironic because if you think of it, the pandemic is actually uh, related to the loss of biodiversity and deforestation. That's the origin of zoonosis and, uh, and the diseases that pass from wild animals to humans. Uh, wild animals are left without a space to live, so uh, they come in contact with us. We uh, have these wet markets or you know, international trade of wild animals, and this increases the chances that something like this happens. So that was quite, quite uh, ironic that very few months after the approval of the European Green Deal, we had, we had uh, this crisis. And then we transformed this um, policy, the European Green Deal, into a recovery instrument. So the recovery uh, plan of the EU is actually the European Green Deal, uh, working along with nature. And the EU is devoting 30% of its budget um, to climate, for example. That's an example. So the European Green Deal involves, as you may have guessed, not only the protection of nature, but also circular economy, um, which is going to take us to where we are today, uh, what we're going to discuss today. It also involves uh, biodiversity, uh, pollution, uh, all the aspects that makes us sick, that makes our economy not sustainable, and that makes our planet eventually can't make it uninhabitable if, if we don't react, right? Um, so why textiles in particular? Why the, the strategy for textiles? Well, the Circular Economy Action Plan uh, which is, as I said, part of the European Green Deal itself, identified a number of value chains where Europe could make a big difference. There are seven of them identified. There was electronics, for example. There was um, uh, critical materials for batteries in electric vehicles. That's another one that is extremely important. And there was also textiles, which happened to have the fourth biggest environmental impact, according to our calculations, uh, after mobility, after the food uh, 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 and transport, etc. So it, it is among the most impactful in environment, um, the textiles uh, and the sector. So that's how this became one of the priorities. Um, and, and the textile strategy was approved a matter of two, three weeks ago. It involved a lot of work, as Erika mentioned, uh, as you can imagine. And the idea of, of the strategy um, is to tackle the huge growth of this um, industry in Europe, for example, and globally. You have, I mean, globally, uh, the textiles industry has um, uh, doubled, more than doubled, um, in 15 years. It's huge. As the commissioner was saying in the video, every year, 11 kilos of clothes, most of them perfectly usable, are discarded. So it's this fast fashion, these unsustainable trends that we're trying to tackle with this strategy. So what are we aiming for? The goals that you were mentioning, Erika. By 2030, the idea is to make sure that all textiles that are placed in the EU market are durable, are recyclable, uh, have a content, a significant content of recycled material. They are free of toxic chemicals and they are produced in respect of environmental conditions and also, very importantly, human rights and social rights. Um, 
this is the, the big goal, the big vision of the strategy by 2030, right? Um, from the consumer point of view, that has implications in terms of avoiding greenwashing, so consumers ha can make the right choice. They can have a methodology, a labeling, for example, that is based on scientific evidence. It's not based on wishful thinking or damn lies from, from industry. So that is an important element. From the producer perspective, um, it means new business models, rethinking the way uh, clothes are produced, um, making them more durable, investing in innovation, having social enterprises, for example, developing the reuse, the collection of, of uh, uh, used uh, clothes that can have a second life, uh, rented, for example, using, um, using the, the business model of product as a service, uh, etc., etc. So this is in a nutshell uh, how it came about and what are the goals of the, of the textile strategy. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump to the affordability question. <laughs> Since you've already given us a lot of details about what eco-design is going to look like, um, and I guess how it becomes a norm is something that I, I think is an interesting problem to discuss. But So one thing that frustrates me often is that as consumers, um, we're implicated in these devastating cycles of what are considered externalized costs, right? Companies that are not held responsible for their waste um, or their manufacturing processes waste, right? Um, into the very products that we buy, that we also have no clean or green way to dispose of, right? In addition to consumer behaviors that have driven the demand higher and higher. One of the issues that seems underrepresented in the conversation has to do with affordability from the consumer's perspective, right? Simply put, fast fashion products are affordable, yeah? So how does the EU textile strategy ensure that this notion of long-lived that the commissioner was talking about is also affordable? What's the plan there? <laughs> it seems an important one. That, that's, that's a difficult one. Um, and one that we have grown accustomed to, you know, to have cheap clothes. It wasn't always that way. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always that way. Uh, so things are, are changeable. And we have created the world we're in. It's not necessarily the world that we must. It's not, there's no fate involved in all this, right? Um, in the, putting together the strategy, we came across a very strange, I would say shocking statistic. It was that while the prices uh, in Europe of clothes had decreased by 30% since 1996, we look at the data and realize that actually households, on average, were spending more and more during that period on clothes. So how do you, how do you fit that? Um, it's basically, it's, it's, it looks like a paradox, but in fact, we're spending more uh, per household in Europe uh, than before. At the same time, the prices are going down because we're buying more and throwing away more. So you don't save anything at the end of the day. And that was part of the, part of the, the, the irony of the paradox of, of the whole thing is that fast fashion is not cheaper uh, if uh, my behavior is to buy and buy and buy and buy and buy because I end up with mountains and then I would just discard them and buy the new one. They are bad quality products that don't last. Um, the color goes, the zips don't work, the seams break, and you're left with something that is unusable in a very few days. So you end up spending the same amount even more it's just that you change to bad quality clothing every, every, every few weeks or, or, or days. Even. So it is, it is a systemic issue, and, uh, and that statistic was very revealing to us. Now, how to make it uh, affordable? In fact, as, I, as I'm saying, we're spending more even though it's fast fashion. It's not cheaper at the end of the day. But when we talk about affordability, I like to think affordability for whom? We were discussing this uh, with Erica before. We live in a complex world, and living here in the U.S. is not the same as living in Indonesia, I don't know, or Uganda, or, or, or Nigeria. Affordability for us, low prices for our clothes, might be good for us, if you, if you think of it. But someone is paying with their health or their lives somewhere else. Look, at, look around you. We have these um, consequences of coal exploitation in melting ice, sea levels uh, rising floods. So 
uh, the way we produce our textiles, actually, uh, cheap textiles, textiles for us, uh, has, a, has an impact on people. They're paying the price. We might not be paying it at the till, but they're certainly paying it uh, when their house is ruined by flooding and they have to move, when their communities in islands in the Pacific just disappear. So we need to look at who's paying the price, affordability for whom. That's the, that's the, that's the key question. Um, anyway, in a less philosophical terms, and I know time is running, so I want to, uh, in this strategy, what we do have is tackling this, uh, uh, making sure that indeed, people don't have to pay uh, more for products that are going to be uh, less durable. So first of all, it's tackling durability. Products that are quality products, trying to innovate in the way fibers are produced. We have a, a research program called Horizon Europe that's going to invest in new fibers. It's possible to develop new fibers. Um, we're going to also uh, look at um, the, the new business models I was talking about. So making it possible, for example, for people to rent clothes more easily, that it doesn't, become, uh, it's not, doesn't have a stigma or anything. Why should it have a stigma? We're renting houses. We live in rented houses. I live in a rented house here. Is that a problem? No, it's just cultural. So it is developing. And I have to tell you, in Europe, in Brussels, for example, there are now many social enterprises creating jobs by collecting clothes and giving them a second life. So it is, it is as, as, uh, also a, an issue of a new business model, and it's a world of opportunity out there for innovation, for business, for citizens, and for clothes that we love and we might be attached to, and we don't want to let go, and that's another uh, important issue. And I think the issue of durability also uh, is linked to the, to the world of emotions. I'm sure that many of you here have had to part with something, with some clothes, and you, wouldn't, you didn't want to part with. Uh, this is the case here, but it's just broke. And this is what we have to fix, right? Um, anyway, I can go on and on on this thing, so I'll, well, I'll, we I'll little, leave it at that. <laughs> we'll have more time to go on and on. And by the way, um, we will have time for Q&A from, from you, from the audience, towards the end of the hour. But I'd like to turn our attention to Celia de Don. Um, and introduce her work with a short visual presentation. I believe some videos and photographs. We'll see that first yeah. and then have a conversation. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> this is all taken with my phone. Thanks first to the Canada Center for inviting me here again. <laughs> um, these pieces were made for a show uh, in Miami, Doral, Doral City. Um, they are all from, you know, discarded pieces or unorthodox materials regarding costume design. You can see these construction mesh. Actually, Jill the Almeida, she was like, okay, look this year, because when these whole new part of the Canada Center was being built. <laughs> yeah, I saw that material. And this is zip ties, um, tie wraps. I don't know the way you'd say it here. Zip ties. This is fencing mesh for garden, gardens. Celia, should we get started and talk over the images, you think? Yeah? Yeah. OK, great. Um, so from the, from the research I've done, you've worn um, a lot of different hats in your career, right? From technical arenas like industrial design to costume design and art direction for over 13 films, if I have the number right, um, as well as everyday wear and, of course, these beautiful wearable sculptures that are behind us that have become widely recognized as examples of sustainable fashion. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey as a designer, sort of how you got to here, how you got to you know, the kind of international arenas in which you show your work now? Um, yes, um, I started, I, I've done these for a while since I, I was a student um, at the industrial 
design institute in, in Cuba. There's only one in the country, so everyone travels to, to the capital if you want to study design. So um, afterwards, I started to work in theater because it's a great arena in terms of what do people expect of what the actors are going to wear. is like at this um, silent agreement where you don't have to be um, realistic, which is, you know, opposing to, to films and, you know, short films, whatever audiovisual term, um, because people expect then reality, and even if it is science fiction. So um, theater was my way um, to even to get here because it was a, this theater play directed for Carlos Diaz because I'm designer for El Público, which is um, his company in Cuba. And there was this play, Antigonon, and I use um, trash cans and, um, you know, various materials, um, wrap um, plastic for the costumes, which is a very interesting, you know, like um, contemporary play. So um, afterwards, um, the Kennedy Center, they asked me to make for the festival, for the Cuban festival, they asked me to make an installation which I've never done. And then I, okay, okay. <laughs> and then I made a five meter costume called Little Black Dress because it was so little. <laughs> and then it was, you know, the staff was involved too because they gave clothes to the lower part. And you, it was like a big installation where you, get, you could get into it and see an actual little black dress inside, you know, inspired on the cocktail dress from the 50s. And, you know, in the, in the meantime, I've done, I've worked with Clandestina, which is a, a brand they made, um, and I've made the two collections they've presented. And yeah, and now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to talk about a concept that comes to mind when, um, when I started learning about your work and watching the videos that I've seen of you at work, including here in the Artes de Cuba, which was in 2018, I believe. Um, there's this sort of real quiet and repetitive determination um, in your process that resonates with um, an idea that I like to embrace, which is that of emergence, right? Um, this notion that when you engage really deeply uh, with a topic or a material or even a group of people, really, um, you aren't sure ahead of time what the engagement will produce, right? It'll take you um, on its own path if you let the elements lead um, instead of imposing like a master plan to begin with. And I feel like um, your work is evidence of that um, because it can be transformative along the way. Um, you know, the product can be transformative. You can be transformed as the creator. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you strike the balance between, you know, what is planned um, and what emerges? How do you work in that space? Yes. Um, of course, design is, is not a, um, a, like a, a cool process, you know, and sometimes the errors are better than your plan. There are several ways to approach um, to something, you know, when someone says, like, let's work on a film or whatever. But in this case, um, it, it's in terms of the materials. Whatever is free, whatever is discarded, whatever is in the trash, whatever is, like, too many, like, just, you know, a pile there, I see, okay, I can do something with that. Because what I'm, we're talking about fashion here and about sustainability, and I think... You can have a hobby for being a sculpture, or maybe you can paint at home, but everyone, some of you maybe, um, some of you don't, but everyone dress every day. So fashion touches everyone, even if you want it or not. So it is something you cannot, there is no way to not to be a fashion victim, you know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and then, so you're a fashion victim sort of a way, even if you're saying that you're not a fashion victim. When you do a film, you have to create a character. And then everything you wear says something about you, even in, unconscious, in your unconscious way of to say that you're not a fashion victim, so you are a fashion victim, you know? And um, that's why I, it, it's really hard to people to see it as, Maybe you do, you know, but, you know, in general, as art, because people, as long as 
they're in a mannequin and say, okay, but as long as, you know, a, a model wears them, it's like a dress. It's a dress. Automatically, it's a dress. And then it's hard and it's a hard way to, you know, to be as wear to be seen as wearable art. But then it, you know, it hits people, you know, it gets there very quickly because everyone relates to the things you put on yourself, on a human body. You know, even jewelry, you know, everything that touches the human body, it's become automatically more human in a way. And all these materials, I think it's like a call to action. You see here, you see um, pool tabs, the little things from the cans, and people get struck because of the material or because of the garment itself or because of the amount of work of the piece, you know. There is another huge polluting industry, which is the event industry, you know. So we have placemats there, you know. And then you take an element from the everyday life and you, like, there is so many because when you have so many of something, you can create something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, then you have a garment because someone left it, you know, and they were new. It was at a wedding, you know. And there is this one, which is like um, pipes from recovered from a construction site, which are, it is my, it's my, my, my fabric, my fabric store. <laughs> and um, for me, the materials, I think, you know, they, they have their own way to, to behave. And it's the same uh, with textiles, for example. And there is, as um, you know, I was saying, that yes, there is, uh, this is the, the industry, which is, I don't know which place it has in the world of being the most, one of the most polluting ones with all the chemicals and afterwards with the tons and tons of clothes which are burned every day, you know, these garden materials and, you know, it's polluting the whole, the whole planet. And that's why I, I do what I do. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great curatorship mm -hmm. because it's like, um, he represents like institution and I represent like a single person, which is, I, I do, what I do like like a single person because and either way I think that there are like these two sides of society you know the institutional and the people who has to have their responsibility you know I, and take things um, for their own you know I, so you're, you're picking up on something that I was also that I also see in your work in general which is the word cumulative came to mind like lots of many right and I wonder if that's intentional, that sense of like, you know, one individual strand multiplied by thousands, like the clips in that piece there, can become strong. Yeah. That resonates with our, the role that we can play in the problem that we're describing. Is, is that in there somewhere in your work? Yeah, sure, because everything is connected and we are all and we are one and we are alone and we are together. Yeah, I think the pandemic has <clears throat> been a proof of that. Like, um, People have developed, you know, more craziness, but, you know, more tenderness and a lot of things uh, like being in a, this weird state of, you know, isolation, you know, has, you know, people have developed hobbies, people that have never repaired their clothes, for example, then made it for a hobby and then, you know, but it's better to start for something, you know. It doesn't matter because we are not going to erase social media and it has good things and it has terrible things too. We're not going to erase that and we're just building the future, you know, because everyone wants to see the change and most of us won't see change. We won't leave for that, but we won't be alive. But our children are, you know, they're going to, they're going to be the ones who are going to inherit that and maybe day either and then it's going to be our grandchildren you know you, we don't know but we have to work one thing at a time and try to do what we can do right now because people say ah, I'm going to throw this away here because anyway I'm just me you know that's just my garbage you know it's your, you're thinking that way and then the other one's thinking that way and so on and so on and so on and the brands they behave in the same way for example, there is some study that, you know, the small brands, 
they're trying not to make labels because you need a new, you, you need a worker to make the label. And then you need to subcontract if you're a small brand to create that label. It's more work, it's more chemical, it's, a, it's another piece of fabric or a piece of, of, of something, you know, synthetic, which is attached to the clothes. And it's, you know, it's an endless chain of work. You know, I was, we were talking about the documentary, The Right Price for Fashion, which is, uh, you're, you're not wearing just a cold piece of clothes, which is, was magically made for, you know, the fairy from Cinderella. You know, there is a lot of people involved in that piece of clothes we're wearing. And, you know, we, we have to have conscious of that in terms of when we are throwing that away. And your, your work shows that so well, like what goes into making something, at least the pieces that we see here. So you, you've talked a little bit about your materials and how you source them. Um, they speak so loudly in, in the work that um, it's, it draws you in and you want to understand more. And I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about the materials you're working with right now and the piece that you're making on this visit at the Kennedy Center. And you've brought a few pieces um, to talk about that are um, there. Do you want to yeah, talk about that? Yeah, I forgot. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, um, for the Cold and the Eyes mm -hmm. exhibition, uh, I asked for, I said to you, that, okay, you can, um, can you, because I was bringing some, can you get me the, some cables? And then they, are, they asked to the staff to, to donate cables. Thank you all, the ones that are here, um, to donate cables. And I, I've, I've, I thought, okay, um, I've seen, you know, computer cables. I thought they were going to be like blue, mainly or orange or yellow. I have a student who's just making um, a dress out of that for Ukraine because they're blue and yellow, the exact same colors of the flag. So, okay, but then most all of them, maybe because they're from home too, are mostly white, gray, and, and black. So it's coal and ice. So that is going to be the piece that I started yesterday. I'm going to be finishing by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. yeah, so gonna, I have to go. Okay. <laughs> we're going to get to see um, Celia at work in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And this is another thing that I brought because it's okay to talk about art and it's very okay. I cannot do that. But this is I made in the pandemic and it's more, um, this is actual clothes, you know. Can you help me? Yeah. It's made out of t-shirts from um, uniforms. And then I can take the, the neck of the t-shirt. And these are these garden materials from old clothes. So we have a jacket. And for example, you were talking about how do you recycle from all the outlets that nobody wants and then stops in the field. And we were talking about zero waste too, and there are so, so many ways to do zero waste. So I have, thank you. Oh my God, thank you. So this is one piece and this is the t-shirt part and this is like spare fabric I had at home. And the piece I took from here is another piece. So it's zero waste. You're not wasting anything and out of one teacher you have like two beautiful things. <laughs> Thank you for showing us that. So um, I, I want to make sure we have time for your questions. So I'm going to sort of circle back around to this notion of, you know, the role of art in sustainable fashion and how art can be a catalyst for change. So. Um, Celia, I wanted to, to ask you, how, and I think you've already given us a bit of a glimpse of this, is how you feel you're part of the solution um, as a designer and an artist to the problem with, with the textile waste. Yeah, this is what I can do. Mm -hmm. I, so I just do it. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, of for me, it, and, and for me, it's like, okay, then I have this amazing opportunity to get in touch with the institution, and I say, okay, look at this. Yeah, that's my part of the solution. Yeah, and, and for to you... To get in touch with people. <laughs> right, and to make it accessible. Um, for you, Manuel, 
Is there um, an aspect to thinking about the role that art can play or does play in, in policy thinking or policy making that, that you want to talk to us about to help us make the connection? Absolutely. Um, I think art can change us and we need to change. Uh, we need to be the change to change the, the, the world. Um, art affects us all. If, if an art, if you don't hate or love a piece of art, it doesn't, have, it doesn't cause any reaction on you. That's bad. You might hate it, but it's creating a reaction. So that is, that is good. Um, and I think these pieces, for example, I saw them for the first time now. I was talking to Celia. And my reaction to this art is right. So trash is what we make of it. You know, we do, we do the trash. When you throw something away, we're making it trash, but it's not necessarily trash. And Celia demonstrates it. It's what you do with things that makes them what they are. So this is no longer, you don't, you don't recognize here trash anymore. You see, this is beautiful. You know, it, and, and that's a concept that we need to use more, you know, to convince that what we're throwing away is a resource. It's something valuable. It's, it's here around us. That's the proof. Yeah, absolutely. I was, I was talking earlier about how artists are essential part of any problem-solving team because they ask the difficult questions. Um, you know, they won't ignore the elephant in the room, but they'll put the elephant front and center so we can talk about it, especially when it comes to issues of power or inequity. Um, but also from what you were saying, Manuel, the mindset change that has to happen, right? I, um, I didn't get a chance to say this, but I teach and work at George Washington University and span both like arts, engineering, and design. And I'm, I like to remind myself and my students that matter is finite, <laughs> right? Everything is interconnected and there is no away. Like we don't throw anything away. There is no place called away, right? It all comes back yeah. to us. There is this great labeling that says man-made material. So it's not leather, it's good. So man-made material comes from nature too. So it's not, it's not coming out of nothing, out of the air, you know? So that's something we have to think about and, you know, focus our attention on how do we can make they work better, better, you know. He knows how to plan, I know how to do, so you match forces and you get to something, for sure. Yeah, and I don't think anyone will, after seeing your work, anyone will open a soda can and toss the aluminum little I bit drank away. The, I drank them all. <laughs> yeah. You drank them all. It's a mindset change interaction, which is, yeah. so, which is what's so needed in this conversation. Um, so I think we're about at the moment when we should open it up, 7.20, look at that, right on time. We have 10 more minutes um, until we'll sort of reconvene for the demo. If anyone from the audience would like to come up, we have two microphones on either side of the stage um, and ask questions. This is a, it's a dialogue and we welcome your questions or comments. If you would, um, wouldn't mind introducing yourself, I'll give you a few minutes, don't be shy. <laughs> You want to come up to the microphone so we can hear you? Thank you. There's one right there on your left. Just on the left there, a little bit further over, on a stand. There you go. Hi. Um, so my question is form and function. Like the three pieces that you have here standing up are absolutely exquisite in terms of form. But in terms of function, they don't look comfortable to wear. Are they meant to be more of a sculpture than a true piece of clothing to wear? Yeah, it's not, I call them wearable installations or wearable art, but I can assure you, no one has ever damaged with it. They, they are not as uncomfortable as you think it could be. <laughs> they are worn by people you know, by models and runways, yeah, to, be, to show. It's not like I'm, I'm gonna be cozy with it, but they are totally uh, wearable and they're comfortable. Yeah, not to be seated and bent over, but, but yeah, it's wearable. Thank you, Celia. Do we have another question? 
Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is, where do you think the best incentives are going to come from for major fashion brands to move towards um, more sustainable fashion? Do you think that'll be social movements or economic pressures or governments making policies? What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a question for either of you, but maybe Manuel, you want to start us off? <laughs> um, I think the pressure is growing from many angles um, because precisely people are more aware of the harm we're causing to the, to the planet and therefore to ourselves. I mean, um, you're saying there's no way. Indeed, there's no way. This is our home. It's our common home. We cannot, we cannot go at this moment anywhere else. So we need to take care of it. I mean, the textiles globally, uh, fashion industry, etc., is responsible for 8%, around 8% of emissions. It's difficult to calculate, but that's the, the, the latest calculation that I've had. 8% of emissions. This is at the same level as an industry that is very carbon intensive, like cement, for example. is more than air travel and, and shipping combined. So, you know, we all have a part to play, and a lot of pressure is going to come from that to the industry because it's a big emitter, and climate change is one of the urgent problems that we have. But there's also pollution, I was referring to it uh, before. Um, there's also the plastic pollution in our bodies, microplastics. Um, some weeks ago, we had for the first time the evidence that uh, there are microplastics found in 80% of us. It was a sample. It was a study from the Netherlands. It found microplastics in 80% of the people sampled in the blood. It also accumulates in the lungs. We are only now starting to understand. And we're using for textiles a lot of polyesters, different types of polyesters, sometimes mixed. When we wash them, as you probably know, these microplastics are, are dissolved and go to the water. They go to the fish and then we eat it. Um, or we drink it from water directly. So... so um, I think a lot of pressure is coming, emissions, health issues, um, uh, and the industry certainly uh, will react to it. We hope so. Do you have a question? Yes. Hi. Um, so my question is really for either of you, but maybe more on the policy side. So I know you mentioned the EU trying to set these new roles and um, goals for shortening, uh, for like creating textiles that are going to be more environmentally friendly and more durable. So my question is, have you, how are you planning on shortening supply chain pollution? I know that transportation is a key factor in pollution. So although the fashion industry does pollute, has a lot of microplastic shedding and a lot of clothes, if these new fibers are being produced country, like thousands of miles away, um, has there been any uh, consideration of creating a more local circular economy into this? Um, and what is the plan for that? Well, that is a, that is a great question. Uh, it really is. Um, it goes to the heart of the, of, of the matter. In fact, uh, by recycling, we're avoiding the supply chains in a way. We're making it local. We have seen in the, in the pandemic and then the, you know, the supply crunch uh, caused also in the, with, by the Ukraine war, etc. How, how the supply chains globally are very fragile at the end of the day. And there are many companies, I mean, we're discussing in the, in the delegation where I work with companies, not on textiles, they work on chemicals, for example, and how they were trying now to reverse the process whereby they had been outsourcing all the business to other places in the world because they realize how fragile these supply chains are. So there's a movement already in industry, in other industries, and also in textiles, to reverse this. But there's also the realization, and this is in our textiles strategy in Europe, that by recycling you're making it local. You're actually making yourself independent from uh, the raw materials that are exported from somewhere else. If you develop the capacity to treat those at home, you don't need these supply chains. It's like Celia when she's doing this stuff, she's not bringing it from exotic places or anything. She, she found it in, in, the, in, the, in the rubbish, people are discarded it in a, in a place. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's just there. There's no supply chain involved. I don't know if Celia wants to... If you are, if you are for example, um, a small business and you upcycle, you know, your supply chain, it can be like in a 
five mile round, you know, only like Goodwills and the huge um, warehouses. For example, in Miami, there are like a warehouse like the size of these, full of t-shirts, of t-shirts and um, I don't know blankets, whatever you can imagine. And they have classifications like a a a uh huh like once worn, refurbished, um, slightly worn, um, I don't know, <laughs> rubbish. You know, and you say, oh, my God, but, you know, there is one target that w there is one thing that has to be targeted and it's the way the consumism, you know, and here it's, you know, totally uh, outrageous how it's like I buy this and then and then I buy the other one. And it's not that even I return it, because if I return it, um, there is in Amazon, for example, you can buy something like, you know, um, used and it's then you save a few bucks and then you buy that one because it's you know it's just returned you know but then you you buy it and it, you just wear it once and then you throw it away not even giving it it's just i'm throwing it away and that's something that has to be targeted too as a consciousness which is not a policy for example but it's something that we all can do and we are then part of that policy Thank you so much for answering my question. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have one, another question. Yes, hello. Can you hear me through this mask? Sorry. My name is Marisa, and I'm a fashion attorney in Washington here. I'm really enjoying the program, so thank you very much. This is a question for Celia. Do you have a ready-to-wear line that might include some of those items you just showed us? And if so, where will we purchase? No. no. I made an Instagram which is called Hysteria Colectiva, like Collective Hysteria, which is meant to be a project to invite artists. Like, for example, I saw the colon colonized exhibition and I saw these beautiful photographs. And I see, oh my God, I see these printed on a night, like, you know, on a garment, you know, to make a clothes out of, you know, this beautiful piece of art. Then you're wearing statement fashion, which is meant to be worn, like, for 10 years, you know, it's like, uh, that's what I love animal print because it's something that it's never goes away. I don't care about trends. It's about how comfortable do you feel with fashion, you know, but that's not how the brands work because, well, it doesn't work that way. It works like you, I do, I, I need profit and then I sell, I sell, I sell. And that's the way it is, at least for now. But I don't have a brand. Well, I have, but I just don't do anything because I don't have a word shirt or anything. <laughs> well, if you're selling those shirts, you have a buyer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think you're next. Do you have a question? Thank you, yes. Hi, my name is Manuela Reyes. I, I come from the Inter-American Development Bank. I'm a curator. And I was curious to know, what do you think is the difference, or your opinion, versus uh, these different initiatives, such as circular fashion versus cradle to cradle? which it comes from the origins of pure recycled materials and organic? So the, the difference between cradle to cradle and, circular, and circularity or circular yeah, fashion. What's fashion. cradle to cradle? Cradle to cradle, it's the fashion that comes from the, or, the origins is purely organic. So it, it's like a complete cycle, organic versus sustainability, completely recycled, upcycled. Is there a perceivable difference from your perspective, maybe, from the policy perspective? I mean, I know this is a question of, of, of language and how it relates to practice differently, but... Yeah, because, because for example, mm -hmm. in cradle to cradle, you can use materials uh, such as wool or other that are purely organic since the origins of the creation, but in circular fashion, it's about recycling and reusing materials. Oh, so, okay. So one envisions sort of the end of a cycle, like an organic garment maybe returning to the earth mm -hmm. versus, you know, the constant sort of renewal or reusing resource of maybe that's something that is not organic or potentially synthetic. Yeah, I've right? seen like, you know, um, I've seen it. It means like these garments that it can be like um, degradable, biodegradable. Yes. I think there are, uh, I think... The industry uh, and you know technology has to advance a little bit more to make 
these kind of um, cycles affordable and um, sustainable because it's expensive to do that, you know, I think. Even, you know, the new materials, there are, you know, banana, um, um, banana fiber textile, and there is orange fiber textiles, and there is then, there is opposing, there is this recycling, and they make more durable, but there is um, plastic materials in those garments too, but we need those too, because otherwise we would be returning to the, you know, Paleolithic, so for the cold, we'll have to wear like this huge, you know, revenant coat because, you know, otherwise you wouldn't have like these super skinny that um, North Face, for example. Do you, do you know what I mean? I, because I'm trying to figure out your question because um, I recognize I don't know much about the subject. Okay. They have very strict policies for the brands that need to be included in each of those initiatives, and there's many mm -hmm. brands that have been joining them, so I was curious to know like the outcome of it. Yeah. No, because in terms of perspective, it, that could be it's both, it's recycling, but um, one of them is totally organic and has like sometimes it's very um, self-centered, you know, and the other side, it's more about making it durable instead of biodegradable. Thank you. Manuel, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I wanted to add. I mean, I, I hadn't heard this term, credit to cradle, but uh, it sounds from what you're saying that it's kind of overlap with the concept of circular economy. I would say there's a kind of not perfect overlap, and I'll, I'll say why there's not a perfect overlap. It's because it, everything that is natural is not sustainable. Like fibers like, uh, I don't know, natural fibers or, or, or wool or, or, you know, um, they take a toll in terms of the water they use, the land use change to grow them, because when you clear forest to grow these things, you have less capacity to absorb emissions, therefore you're making climate change worse. So these are impacts that are indirect, indirectly coming. So credit to cradle, if, if that's the, the answer to your question, I'm, I'm not sure. You need to look also at the, at the, um, at the impacts that are indirect but are there. Uh, by using natural fibers, you would think, well, they are biodegradable, my problem is solved. Well, let's see upstream, where do they come from, and if we have cleared the forest to, to, to Yeah, to it's like it. the same di dichotomy between plastic metal and crystal paper. It's because, okay, why plastic? And then, okay, let's clear the forest to make paper. So it's, I, I think it has to be a balance. That's what their policies. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, but it's, it's a balance, and it's a really... You know, it's a really fine line between both sides. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for your question. So um, I know we're running a little past 7.30. We started a few minutes late, so I'll, I'll give time for one more question. Go ahead, sir. Hi. Uh, beyond, my name is Daniel. Beyond the, um, the protocols and production protocols that you are planning to use, is there an educational effort behind it? And if there is, would you mind elaborating on that? Yep, that's for you, Manuela, an educational aspect to the textile the, the, strategy. You talk about the awareness aspect and the education. Yeah, yeah indeed, indeed. Uh, for fast fashion is a, is a cultural um, uh, issue as much as it's driven by industry. Uh, and it's going to be difficult to get rid of it and drive it out of fashion, as, as my boss was saying, if there's no um, comprehension of the complexity of the industry and the, the links that we're seeing with nature, with, with uh, manufacturing processes, with emissions. So all that indeed requires you know, uh, some, some knowledge and some awareness. And we are tackling it in the, in the strategy as well. And furthermore, we're also tackling and something we haven't touched upon, skills. Um, how, how can we reskill, how, uh, how, how can we retrain people to instead of uh, producing blindly uh, stuff, actually they are employed in giving clothes a second life and recycling them. Uh, these are new jobs that don't exist right away, but you know, they will exist in a way if we, if we go in the right path. Um, these skills can be passed and can be uh, taught. Um, you know, Celia has you know, magnificent skills to do what she does. I've got mine. We can all learn, and I think jobs of the future will depend also on this reskilling effort. And this is part, is one of the sections of our strategies 
a, a pact for skills in Europe, which will retrain people to the green industries of the future, including uh, innovative uh, textiles, recycling, etc. Thank you for your question. Certainly the labor conversation is, could take us a whole nother many hours to talk about. Um, but I'd like to thank you both for your generous thank answers you. and thank all of you for your questions. Um, I believe we're going to um, transition now to getting to learn more from you directly, Celia, um, and to see how you're, what you're working on. Yeah? Yeah, I'm just going to do my stuff here. I know. <laughs> She's going to do her stuff, but we get to walk around, interact, and continue talking. Thank you all very much, and thank you to the Kennedy Center and the Asia Society.